Let's start talking about microphone pickup patterns. Which direction microphones pick up? You know, some mics are very directional, some are not. There's three main types of microphone pickup patterns. The omnidirectional, which picks up equal in all directions. Bidirectional, where it picks up in opposite directions, opposite 180 degrees from each other. And unidirectional, where it usually picks up primarily from one direction. Okay, obviously in the studio, there are microphone configurations that you can do with bidirectional, omnidirectional. For example, uh, let's say we're miking up a round table discussion for a television show and we're left with one microphone in the center of the table. You want it to be omnidirectional. Let's say we're picking up the ambience in a room. You'd like it to be omnidirectional. Problem is, is it'll pick up from the ceiling as much as it picks up from the floor, as much as it picks up from the forward and backward. And sometimes you'll pick up air ducts or foot traffic, and you'll pick up sounds you don't really want to record or have involved in the microphone pickup pattern. So in general, in the studio, I use unidirectional microphones, which are in one direction primarily. There are methods of miking that use bidirectional as well. For example, let's say you've got one microphone and you've got two vocalists and you want them to sing a duet. And you put the microphone between them and they both sing into the same microphone. You can make it bidirectional so it picks up each vocalist. If I'm in that kind of situation, generally speaking, I'll use a microphone that picks up in one direction but put them standing side by side and let them step up to the microphone a little more when it's time for them to sing. But I can't say that sometimes people like to watch each other when they sing in unison or sing together. So having a bi-directional mic is great. Or two unidirectional mics, one for each. See what I'm saying? So there's a multitude of ways of picking up what you're trying to record. So I don't generally find a lot of use for omni and bi-directional. But we will talk about microphone techniques that involve both of those. But generally speaking, I'd say 80 to 90% is unidirectional. So the pickup patterns. So three general polar pattern categories, omni, bi, and unidirectional. In unidirectional, there are subcategories of cardioid, supercardioid, and hypercardioid. Let me show you a little bit of what these look like. So here's an omnidirectional pickup pattern. So the three-dimensional drawing here kind of helps you sort of appreciate how it picks up. And the way that it's represented in, say, you're buying a microphone and you get the technical literature that comes along with it, it's represented in this way here. It shows you the directions it picks up. And usually these polar patterns are for one kilohertz. But you see from this polar pattern that as you go down in frequency from 20,000 hertz, 15,000, 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, it becomes less directional. This ties into what we were talking about when our ears can pick up directionality. Low frequencies, microphones, almost all of them become omnidirectional. But at high frequencies, they all become more directional. Okay, so most of these polar plots, these are called polar plots, showing the pickup directions, are based around the basic frequency of one kilohertz. So you can sort of have a, a way of comparing microphones. Here's a bidirectional, bidirectional or figure eight, it's sometimes called. Equal pickup from the front and the back, rejects most at the sides. So you see the polar pattern, how it looks. Cardioid polar pattern. Now it's called cardioid for a very good reason. As you can see here, this shape here, kind of starting to resemble a heart. It picks up primarily in this direction over here. It rejects sound from behind itself, right? This is a cardioid picks up most from the front, rejects most from the back. Supercardioid, on the other hand, is more directional in the front, but has a little bit of pickup in the back. So it's starting to look a little more like a bi-directional microphone, but it's really still focused primarily to the front, even more heavily than a cardioid microphone. That's supercardioid. Hypercardioid is even more directional forward, but it also has this little bit of directionality in the back that it picks up from. Hypercardioid, you know, the only time that I've seen hypercardioid um, microphones used, the question is, when do you pick up a hypercardioid microphone versus a regular cardioid? And that would be in a situation where you really want to focus a microphone at one specific sound. So, for example, maybe in a uh, film where, you know, you've got two different speakers in a situation and you really want to sort of isolate the others, pick them up individually, 
and really heavily focus and reject sound from the other sound source. The other time that they use hypercardioid sometimes is, say, on a football field, right, when they want to pick up sound of a coach yelling at a player or something a few feet away. They want to reject all the other noises, so they really focus it in one direction as much as possible. Here's a handy chart that I put together that will help you understand it. And you notice that when you go from cardioid to more directional in the front, it becomes more bidirectional to the point that it eventually becomes bidirectional. So I'll tell you quite honestly, 99% of the microphones I use are just cardioid. And of course, all the microphones have specialized options depending on what kind of microphone, what manufacturer, and so on and so forth. High-pass filters to eliminate rumble, you know, or somebody tapping their foot as they're singing. You don't want to pick that low-frequency rumble up. A pad to reduce the, the level coming into the mic so it doesn't distort. Multi-pattern switches so you can take one microphone and change patterns. Most of the good microphones have that option. So you can combine two patterns and create a new one. Here's an example. So some of the very good microphones actually have two diaphragms inside so that you can combine them and create different polar patterns. Here's another example. Position one is cardioid, position two is omni, bidirectional, and uh, super cardioid. So you can create whatever polar pattern you want using two diaphragms. Polar patterns come along with all the technical literature you can find online for any microphone, and mostly it has to do with what direction it's going to pick up. The last type of microphone I wanted to discuss, well, no, not the last, there's one more after this, is the pressure zone microphone. And basically, this is a PZM microphone, which is uses a sub-miniature kind of condenser capsule facing down to a reflecting plate. So what happens is this plate, and I used to use these on drum ambience. I'd like tape a PZM microphone on a window. So you're trying to capture a surface, and air sound hitting that surface actually moves the microphone and creates the sound. So it's the kind of microphone you'd use, say, in an acoustic guitar, right? A PZM type microphone. It uses a secondary uh, boundary as a reflecting plate for the sound. Some sound very good though. I, I actually, in a live situation, used to use two of these inside a piano because they sounded good and they rejected sound better from other instruments. They're worth looking at and experimenting with. Last but not least, stereo microphone built to try to simulate what your ears would be like. I don't adhere to this principle. Some people think that every sound that's recorded should be in stereo because we hear in stereo because we have two ears. I don't believe that that's the way I like to work. Some people have tried that where they've done every sound in stereo. And because we're, we're, we're creating different sonic pieces that actually eventually get blended together into a stereo picture, I think that it's kind of overkill to create every sound in stereo and then try to, try to mix them. So when somebody gives me files that are all stereo, like, for example, bass guitar or bass synthesizer, why would it ever have to be in stereo? I can't even hear where it's coming from in terms of directionality, and there's no reason it needs to be in stereo. Kick drum, same thing. So there are sound elements that I just believe sound better when they're mono and positioned in a field, in a sound field that's stereo in my mix. But the sound itself being recorded in stereo, some people believe has to be because we would hear it in stereo and so it's most accurate but i don't believe so it's my own personal feeling about it the micro what they do is generally they they have a a wide kind of mic stand where they have two capsules split like the distance of where your ears would be and so on and, you know, and people do all sorts of crazy stuff with microphones trying to simulate what our ears would be like and i think that sort of comes back to the the principle that our ears are in stereo, so everything we hear is in stereo, so we should record everything in stereo. And I think when you're breaking something down into its sound elements and then recreating a mix in stereo, each sound element that it's broken down to can be a mono sound and actually sound better, I think. Okay, so accessories, windscreens, pop filter, shock mounts, those are all sort of accessories in the studio that mostly you probably wouldn't use in a live situation. The windscreen and pop filter, actually, people sometimes have a misconception of what it's used for, at least in my personal experience. And it really doesn't affect the sound quality of what the singer sounds like as much as it protects the microphone from big blasts of air. So pop filter, meaning when you hit a P, that burst of air, 
can really rattle a sensitive microphone and give you all sorts of distortion and, and bad sounds. So what they try to do is break up that burst of air by going through uh, a piece of cloth of some sort. So it really sort of helps to protect bursts of air from the microphone. That's what they're typically used for. But I find the most important use for me personally is that when I'm working with a condenser microphone and I'm singing or somebody's singing into a condenser microphone, if they sing directly into the microphone, naturally our breath has humidity in it. And because it has so much humidity, what happens is it hits the cold capsule, which is metal. And just like, I don't know how many people are from cold environments, but windows that freeze up in the winter because it's cold out and there's humidity in the room. And so it basically hits, or, or like uh, the mirror when you take a shower, it gets foggy with humidity, right? And that's because the air is humid and it's hitting a colder surface and condensing on it. And that's what can happen to the microphone capsule with a singer singing directly into it with humidity in their breath. And it doesn't immediately affect the sound, even though it does because it adds more mass to the capsule because it's got little humidity beads. And it's so small, it's not like drops. It's very, very small amount of humidity that collects there. The worst thing, though, is that after the singer finishes singing, the mic's hanging there, any dust particles that are floating around in the air that accidentally float into the microphone, there's humidity there, they'll stick to it. And then all of a sudden your capsule starts getting dirty with dust. After about four or five years of using the same microphone, you don't perceive that it's sounding not as good, but it starts losing high frequency response because you're putting more mass on the diaphragm, which makes it less sensitive, which in turn means that it can't pick up as high frequency. So there was a guy in town that just made a business out of taking apart these very old vintage sensitive microphones that were very expensive and people trusted them, their mics to him and he'd take them apart piece by piece, miniature screw by miniature screw, take the capsule apart and take these into ultrasonic baths, clean them and put them back together. And it cost a pretty penny to do. But man, when you got the microphone back, it was just like it was brand new again. It's kind of like you don't notice how much it wasn't sounding as good as it always did. Because over time, it just got worse and worse. Kind of like if you don't wash your windshield, you don't notice. And after a while, you go, wow, it's really dirty. And then you clean it and all of a sudden, wow, I can see everything again.